Okay. In the chat box, um, you guys can grab the workbook for uh, what we'll be going through today. So last week, um, we discussed the importance of offers and positioning um, kind of in the high level view. Um, what we're going to talk about today, um, that's even more important. Um, and that really um, is, is really the base of all of this is taking an offer and being able to take action on it and know and validate it. Okay. So how many of you um, have made an offer um, or have experience making offers, be it through ads or anything? Has anybody ever actually crafted their own offer on the call here? Yeah, I have. I, I believe. <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, I have. Yeah. Okay. So describe it to me. Yeah, so, so long ago. Um, well, originally, and you're going to hate this, um, we we did do um, an ad campaign about rot, which is prevalent in our, in okay. our target market. I like that. And we offered to come out and do a free exterior market analysis from ground level. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. So that is a, that's a, that's a perfect example of, of a campaign, an offer. All right. Now what we have to recognize is that, like I was saying last week, um, that offers exist in every aspect of our business. Okay. Our whole business is, is built around a core offer. Okay. And a lot of times we misunderstand that mechanism. All right. So the mechanism is your offer can be adjusted to the group that you're targeting. Okay. We can make other types of offers inside of our core offer, right? It's very versatile, but, but if you can't clearly, like clearly explain what you do and have it be differentiated than what everyone else is offering, you're going to find yourself almost always being compared on price, almost always being, you know, finding resistance in your sales process. And it's very difficult to scale your business. And here's really the best analogy that I can use to explain this. All right. We have a blue ocean. Okay. The blue ocean is where we want to be. All right. In the blue ocean that is filled with hungry clients that are looking to be fed. All right. A big, big crowd of hungry clients that nobody else is feeding. All right. On the other side, we have the red ocean. All right. Where very few clients are and everyone's trying to feed those very few clients. All right. So when we think about our business, the more we can put ourselves into the blue ocean and, and blue oceans exist in every category, every type of business. And it's really coming down to what, what are we saying that's getting the attention of our ideal client and, you know, coming back to the core base, a specific problem, you solve a specific way for a specific person. Okay. What an offer is not all right is services. Anybody can like, that is the simplest, most easiest format. It's like, um, and that's going to put you into commodity, right? So if you go out and say, Hey, I'm a general contractor, congratulations. We'll put a tag on you into the red ocean. You go. Okay. If you go out and like Patty, just, just use the example. I'm a rot, you know, I'm a, I'm a rot specialist, um, that offers services in this metropolitan and, you know, to get started, we, we can help you do by doing this evaluation. Okay. You see how that's dramatically different? Yeah, I right? had I had before and after pictures of our findings sure. and I had testimonials in the ad as well. For sure. So everything else is built on top of that, including our sales process. So guys that are struggling with sales a lot of times, what I find underneath that is that we're trying to sell something, first of all, at a commodity. All right. So um, no matter how hard you try, if you have a Lamborghini type service, all right, and you're only speaking to Honda Civic buyers, your your market doesn't fit. Okay. And until we really recognize what, you know, what those things are, it's very difficult to grow or scale your business. And adding more marketing or buying a marketing company or trying to pay for leads, all this stuff fails at every level. Okay. As well as the biggest thing that fails, you can't scale. So the business becomes dependent on you and you alone. Okay. And that's what I see all too often. It's what I went through in my experience. And it was like the mystery box that the piece of the puzzle I was just always missing and I couldn't figure out. Right. I'm like, you know, I offer the best, like I'm doing all this work to make my business really be able to perform. And like, you know, we had the best crews, we had, you know, brand new trucks, but it was my offer to the market. Once I recognized, Hey, you know what, if I learn to make better offers, and things that, you know, directly spoke to these type of customers I want to do business with, 
all of a sudden I'm only attracting these type of customers, right? I'm only getting this type of business. And then from there, it's, you know, again, it's, it's more about filtering through what you don't want, right? So if we're doing high-end renovations for high-end customers, all right, and we are only, you know, we know that we do best work in this particular area, all right, is it, is it worth our while to, you know, um, do a generalized campaign that attracts you a bunch of low, low end tire kickers, right? Or in your sales process, how do you differentiate between what's a good customer and a bad customer? How can you with confidence, with certainty say every single time, like, you know, we're hitting our direct customer to know your marketing is actually effective. Okay. So again, um, I know that some of you have already had this conversation. It may feel slightly redundant, but we're going to go, oh, oh, we're going to go through it anyways. Um, so in our workbook, all right, um, what we're going to really try and narrow down is like, you got the concept of an offer. All right. That's, that's sort of your first step. Okay. I, I kind of get that. It sounds a lot like a marketing campaign or like, you know, and again, I challenge everyone to kind of look around at offers that are being thrown at you 24-7, 365. Go into Facebook, go anywhere, and you're going to start to see every business that exists has some sort of offer, all right? But the clearer you can be and the more specific you can be to the exact person that you're, you know, trying to speak to, the better and better your business becomes, okay? You don't even need, you know, remarkable um, uh, marketing at that point, you, you can get by with pretty average stuff. Okay. Um, so let's talk about how we actually build these things. All right. We're going to go through the process of actually, you know, thinking about how we'll put these things into, into play. So I use, a, we're going to, we're going to uh, use the seven P framework. All right. And these are all the essential things that, uh, you know, go into creating a really great offer because it's not just like what you do, how you do it. Like there's other components that come with it, right? So who here feels they compete on price? Maybe give me a one in the chat there. How many of you guys feel like you're competing on price only? No one that's, no one will admit it, right? No, I do. <laughs> okay. All right. Appreciate your honesty. Okay. So let's think about price for a second. Is price important to your offer? Is being the lowest or the highest guy is it, it, like? Do you, do you feel that's important to to the offer you're trying to build in your business? No. Okay. So I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say yes, and but I'm probably going to put a little bit of a twist on this. There is no strategic value at all in being the lowest price guy. Okay. There is, however, strategic value in being the highest price. Okay. So that's one way to kind of look at it. I'm of that framework. I want to sell. I want to do the least amount of work for the most amount of money, all right, with the customer that I can work with that's always the same. That's that's the principle. Now, can that always work? Not always. That again, I've got a very niche I'm doing, you know, standing sea metal roof, very specific. It's already geared for a higher level clientele, like somebody that's just a middle class blue collar person isn't isn't really in the market for a metal roof. Okay? Now, on the other hand, you know, we could be offering plumbing services. We could be offering electrical HVAC. So price does have a factor there. Okay. And if we want to be on the higher side, it's very important that we understand where we stand in pricing. Okay. Um, and I'll give you kind of a, a Coles notes of what I'm, what I'm, what I'm saying here. Um, most of us assume that we're the highest price. I get that all the time. No one ever wants to admit they're the lowest. I haven't had anyone being like, yeah, I'm, I'm the basement, right? I'm just charging the least. And then they say, well, I'm the highest price because, you know, I've been told that. Wrong. That's not how we play this game. You got to validate your price. So, and we're going to talk about how to validate that your pricing actually fits the market, okay? Pricing also can move up and down, which most people don't recognize and they don't they don't play this game well enough. So, um when it comes to price, Maybe that you maybe you do lower your price in intervals, all right, and your volume goes up, okay. And if your volume goes up, you're still more profitable, all right, if you can accommodate that, all right. And a lot of times when we're trying to scale a business, meaning that or we're trying we're trying to uh, do scaling, meaning grow, right? 
um, what happens is we're going to have to test the new price ceiling. Okay. Um, the only way that you can do this with um, a slight bit of security and certainty is we're going to do a thing called a SWOT analysis. And I'm going to explain that to you in a second, but to, you know, to be absolutely crystal clear, yes, pricing does matter. Okay. Especially when you're validating an offer. Okay. And the slight changes in that and testing of your pricing points um, often lead to kind of that um, I'll call it the golden triangle, right? Where you're maybe 25% profitable. All right. On paper, which is totally sustainable. All right. But your volume now is, you know, you've got more opportunity than you can manage. That's a good place to be. We can, we can scale now. Okay. Um, and then again, as you start to level out, maybe your prices come up and you've built, you know, a whole base to your business. So that's one, one way to think about pricing. All right. Now place, um, location, does that matter in, in, in your offer? Absolutely. Hundred percent. I mean, I can't stress this to you enough. Um, location and place and all those kind of things, um, they have to be considered, um, as well as like um, where your where your hungry clients are. So if you're if you're gearing to a high end uh, clientele um, that's 150 kilometers away from where you're located, all right, it's going to be very difficult to fully compete on that price. All right, you're going to be at a, a very big disadvantage. All right, so if you know the high-end subdivision or the multi-million-dollar homes are an hour and a half away from you, all right, we may want to look at well, what's going on with this? You know, the middle class or the middle market, and adjust our offers to suit that location. Okay, so again, what's that involve? Right, it comes back to the same principle that I was sharing with you before. You cannot sell a Lamborghini as hard as you want. And as hard as you try, you cannot sell a Lamborghini to a Honda Civic client, all right? So unless you know or sure that your audience has enough people in it that are looking for Lamborghinis, you're going into a red ocean. You're trying to offer something that's maybe too high quality or over top of what your customer is willing to pay, the location they're at, right? And the next one is, again, um, you know, really looking at how we promote our offer, right? So... Um, how many of you guys would identify yourself still as really great craftsmen or tradesmen? Yeah. Okay. I've, I've sort of lost that identity a bit. Trevor, would you say you're still like, you, you know, identify primarily as a, as a, a technician? Yes, I do. Okay. And that's absolutely fine. All right. Um, the problem though, that's when we're thinking about these offers and how to build them and how to structure them. Okay. Um, is how we promote ourselves. Okay. The, 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 the networks or the channels that we're using to promote our offer or even how, you know, how we present our offer. Okay. So, uh, the best kind of example that I can, um, I can share with you on this is like offering a discount to a high level you know, wealthy client is not a f as effective as offering a discount to a middle-class blue collar um, um, customer. And that's just date, like that's a data fact. Okay. Where those offers do best. All right. Is genuinely in that middle, middle-class market. Okay. Um, now that's not to say that they don't have the same expectations or like you can't, you can't deliver the same type of service. But it's simply how our bear, like it's our point of entry, okay. Um, as well as uh, I'll say, you know, kind of rolling into this next part of offer, like people. Um, and Nick, we, you and I were talking about this last night, but um, there's definitely um, in in Ontario at least we have like cultural differences, okay. So when we think about people, all right, the type of person we're selling to, that doesn't just include demographics such as like, you know, age, all that stuff, it can be cultural as well. All right. So, um, you know, without, uh, without getting too deep into this particular topic, you know, I, for example, have a very hard time doing business with any Indian cultured people. And it's not because they don't have affluent people or anything like that. It's literally um, just a cultural difference, right? So we know whenever we go to the city of Brampton, all right, which we don't, um, that we have a very, very low closing margin, no matter what we do, okay? No matter how hard we try, no matter how much we change. So if I know that, 
why would I, why would I even accept estimates in that location after, you know, a certain point of time, if you knew you were losing, you know, you're, you're landing one in 50 versus, you know, being 30 kilometers away where I land, you know, 25 and 50. Well, that's obviously not a, it, it's a people person problem, right? It means that our offer doesn't align with their culture. And that can happen. And in other, other, a ton of other examples, I'm just using that one because it was top of mind, but that's a, that's a good example of what we need to think about when we're generating a new offer. Anybody got any questions so far? No. I think, uh, can you hear me? Yep. I think back to your question, just you still appear something like you're still a good tradesman. Mm -hmm. I think it's more, yeah, I can still do it. Right. They still, like when I talk to guys about building a bid or a quote, mm -hmm. I could do it in this speed at this level of perfection, right? Is mm -hmm. that's what I felt when you asked that question. Yeah. So, and here's the thing though, like when we, like in order to get a good offer, we have to, like, it's not enough to say I'm a good tradesman. I'm really good at what I do. It's not enough to say, um, for example, I do high quality work. Nobody can do, no, no one's better than me at the, the quality. And we, as technicians, we send to really focus on the technical, how, like how we can technically do the job. And I've talked to you guys, especially, especially electricians, I'll just call you guys out. Like you're, you're all about a technical sale, right? You want to prove to your customer your worth by like your knowledge and like the explanation of how you do your service. But does that fit an offer that scales? The answer is no, right? Because it doesn't take, it's not good. It's not enough just to be good at what you do. All right. When you want to scale a business, it's enough to get by. It's enough to get referrals and like live off, you know, that, but in terms of really have a, an offer that scales into a business that can operate without you, like, no, you can't, you can't just say that you do quality work or that you're a skilled technician or like, we're the, we're the best. It doesn't, it yeah. doesn't work in any market. i had always but, said like, back when I was on the tools and in the van, it was, mm -hmm. you know, how do I leave the client feeling like, right. Like, that's a good holy fuck, I, I trust that guy with my baby, like, right. you know, yeah. and that emotional connection. And I think we've lost that in the last few years. I can't, sure. I can't agree with you more. Um, I, I totally 100% will hardly agree with that. And people are craving it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and then we're fighting the other side of it as well as like people, um, the way that our society is moving, we move faster. Right. So like we have less of a time, we're more distracted. Right. There's more, you know, you know, go back 15, 20 years ago, even five years ago, how, how often were we being hit with offers? Like I'll say a fraction of what we are being hit with. Now you open up your phone, you, you know, you watch TikToks, you watch any of this, it's subliminally built into the stuff we're consuming, right? You're being hit with them probably 20 to 30 times an hour, right? Somebody offering you, pitching you something. So what happens to us is that we become resistant, right? So, you know, again, in 1950, just being a good, you know, a, a, a really credible um, home builder could have, you know, been enough to be, you know, to grow and scale a business. All right. But nowadays it doesn't. Okay. It just doesn't work. We have to be um, a lot more um, aware of what, what actually resonates with our, with our clients and with our audience. So maybe that could be, I don't know, is that something that could be somehow built into my offer? Like 100%, 100%. But you have to, again, this is what we call, what we say by crafting the offer, right? So like until you really think about all of the aspects that go into it, all right? Because it's not just like a lot of people think that, and, and I see this a lot, like they, if they're even doing it at all, most people will hire a marketing agency, okay? That marketing agency has an offer that they made up Okay. Knowing, you know, how people think and everything else and how they convert, they'll make an offer up and then put it on you. Okay. The problem with okay. that though, is it's like wearing somebody else's underwear. Okay. Mm. The offer doesn't really fit what it is that you deliver. Okay. It doesn't really fit the personality of your business and it's generic that it'll never scale. All right. Now I promise you, this is not by mistake. The reason why they're doing that is like, 
if Stock I could money. take it, yeah, yeah, exactly. If I could take this one offer, well, now I can put this same thing on that moderate, like, you know, mediocrely performs on every single company that, you know, I can go and get a hundred electricians, run the same offer and, and we're done. Easy, right? Yeah. Now where that fails is in scale, right? So when you need to stand out and like, for example, put you up against 10 other electricians and you come out dominant nine or eight times out of 10, all right, that's a scalable business, all right, from a, from a marketing offer perspective. If you get put up against them and you're coming out two or one, all right, you can't scale that business. So you're going to, you're going to spend a lot of time stuck in that, in that place. And then it doesn't matter your platforms or anything else like that. You will always, it's the way that you communicate your message. It's the way that your brand comes across to your, your clientele. That makes sense. Yeah. Right. And yeah, those good, like those good people that we align with, mm -hmm. the guys gel with them. Right. It's That's right. easy. It's fucking no resistance. It's That's just, right. It's an, it's an enjoyable experience from the phone call to the invoice. Like it's just yeah. awesome. And, and again, every system in your business should be built around those customers. Okay. So m let me give you an example. Like, again, I stress speed because speed is universal with any customer, like with any clientele, but you know, speed and delivering a high, like, you know, our, the way we deliver our quotes, for example, we're still, and I know this for a fact that we're still twice the price as our nearest competitor. Okay. And I also know that it would be stupid for me to try and sell middle-class subdivision homes. That's not like, that's, that's just a waste of time. All right. So for us, we're only looking for specific customers N then adding speed to that. All right. Our whole business is built around selling to that you know, high net and worth individual and their problems and their wants, needs, and desires are not the same as somebody, you know, below that, that threshold. Okay. And your business should be the same in my opinion. All right. And again, that's, that's up for debate. Um, there's lots of uh, huge companies out there that, that do very successfully serve that middle class. Um, but you'll find that all the most successful contractors that you'll look at, they can be differentiated from anybody else in the market. Okay. The ones that are really crushing it have a unique mechanism that the clients and the audience that they're there in front of the ones that you, you know, again, that have the majority of the business, they've been able to figure out that customer and make a consistent offer to them over time. And that's how they've grown. Okay. It's not even necessarily marketing. It's not just throwing money at the, at the wall either. Okay. Any other yes, um, any other input on this before I move on? Appreciate the uh, the chat. Yeah, sorry for taking up time. No, no, this is perfect. I I much rather some engagement here to to make sure that I'm not just up here ranting like a crazy man. And we had you know three sectors that we work in and had three mm -hmm. USPs kind of that's built, right, right? Uh, that's right. for three separate offers. That's right. Exactly. So again, you know, the, the other kind of thing that I see quite often is guys, especially when you're starting out, um, is tr guys trying to be too many things. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's the most common. And, and, and again, the, the, the idea when you start out is that like, you know, it's that scarcity. I don't have clients. I need clients. I'm willing, I could be good at all these things. Okay. As your business matures though, you realize very quickly, like I can't be all these things. It's too many variables. It's too difficult. So we start to narrow down and that really becomes where we get that first, like first aha moment, like the specific person, right? We can't do business with everyone. Why? Because not everybody has the same values and has the same principles that are going to allow us to easily, you know, make a sale in that, in that area. Right. So um, process, again, we're, we're kind of talking about this, this already, but process is really important. Okay. The way that we, the way that we do our sales, what we say, how we handle objections. Do you think that that changes um, from client or from, from um, market to market? Would the sales process, and I mean, I think this is probably a stupid question, but would the sales process be the same for for a um, service electrician doing residential or a service electrician doing commercial? Would do you think those sales processes would be the same? No, no it'd be different. No. For sure. Not even close. Similarities, yes, but 
not even close. So again, what what happens when we've got somebody trying to do residential and commercial at the same time under the same umbrella? What do you think happens? They get diluted down, right? It's very it's very hard um, to capture both those kind of offers because you're speaking to two completely different audiences. Now, can it be done? Hundred percent. Um, most of the time when I see this is done is like somebody learns how to scale a residential offer. All right. They get really, really good at it. And then they figure out this and then they're able to, you know, capture what a commercial offer is. And, and even they'll run it under different divisions and stuff like that. But if we can't get our offer right at what we do best, I highly recommend that you don't try and do something that you're not so great at. All right. Especially when it comes to marketing. Okay. We only get a very, you know, I think that, you know, the, the statistic now is like on a, on an ad, for example, we have three seconds to make an impression, All right? That's a, that's a very short window of time to get somebody's attention. And then after that, it's even harder to keep their attention. All right. So think about the whole process of somebody seeing an advertisement of yours and then deciding to call you like that whole, that whole thing has to be completely on point, right? And then the process of the way you've treated them throughout the sale or throughout the sales process has to also be like, you know, something they've never experienced to stand out. Okay. Um, now we can get to physical evidence. Um, and I feel like this is one of the things that gets um, really overlooked and overshadowed in a lot of marketing. Um, but it's the simple things, right? Like, do, you know, if you are marketing and let's say you put out an image in your ads that show a uniform staff member showing up with a beautiful, you, like lettered truck. Okay. And then your service, when they actually call you, it's some, some, you know, scrub guy with, you know, beat up clothes showing up in a, in a pickup truck. Like, like there's a big disconnect there, right? And no matter what, no matter how great your service is, you could be, again, like it could be the most phenomenal electrical service there was, you're still not going to satisfy that customer, all right? They're not probably going to give you referrals. The, the, you know, the expectation was lost right off the bat, okay? And I always, I always see this a lot. And I know I'm, I, I struggle with this, even to this day with our, with our company is, you know, what we put out, in our advertisements, in our marketing, in our messaging, in our, you know, our daily communication. All right. We have to be very, very critical of that is, are we actually delivering that? Is that, is that a true statement? Okay. If you get, you know, again, as you want to grow and scale, if you don't have KPIs that can tell you, all right, are our customers satisfied? If you're building your whole offer on customer service, all right, speed, all those things, and you're getting negative reviews nonstop, all right, telling about customers how you made them wait for, you know, two days rather than one day or whatever. Well, again, wh where do we need to make that adjustment? What what needs to change in our messaging, right? Can we say that we're the fastest, we're like, you know, 24, 24 seven um, electrical service? No, right, if we're not offering that, if that's not actually something that we can um, successfully do every single time, then don't, don't include that. You can't include that in your offer. It's not, it's, um, it's not going to go well. Does that make sense? Hey, Jay. Uh, so I just got my brand new transit. Do you suggest that I not put lettering on it? If I got my guys driving their beat up van and the uh, trucks and no, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. Um, again, but you would be very cautious of what you say. For example, like, again, if you tell, if you're putting a image out, all right. An image is a, a good one or a copy. That's what goes into an ad. All right. And you're saying, you know, all in-house staff. Okay. There's a market for that. Here's people that believe that that is, they're going to get the best service from that. Right. You're showing a professional with a full uniform and all that. Okay. You're, you're going to attract a customer that's expecting those things. Okay. If that's not what you actually deliver. All right then you're you're going to you're going to consistently have problems you're not going to be able to scale that offer and it's very simple principle right like you're not delivering what you're promising right even if it's a minor thing it's a it's an image thing okay if you yeah so like i don't i recommend you get your trucks lettered i, I recommend all that right but 
<clears throat> again, you may have to um, communicate in your sales process also that you use subcontractors, right? You might explain how you manage subcontractors, right? That would become part of your sales process so that no one feels let down at any point during this, during the, you know, the, the sale. Mm. That makes sense. So yeah, again, yeah, yeah, like, cause yeah. you got to yeah, get down to like, like to hear that, that they got, you know, Oh, you're using subs. So it's like, Oh, you don't yeah. even know these guys. Well, they've been working for me for like 10 years. No, no. So, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't even like everyone will say that. Right. So if I were, if I were explaining some, and we do, right. Um, is we lean on the way we manage our, our teams, right? We manage, we lean on the fact that they have peace of mind dealing with our company. All right. And that we handle everything from, you know, A to A to Z and they're guaranteed the, the outcome, right? We show them our company cam. Like there's, there's ways that you can present that, that actually, you know, again, no one really cares, right? As long as you have good management and, you know, it doesn't take away from the job that they're getting. So most general contractors use subs, right? Like the subs are used throughout. It's just a matter of how you're presenting that and explaining it in your sales process. So again, this is how like tied into an offer it is. It's okay to have that you do use subcontractors. It's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. Right. Provided they may meet the standard that you've set with the client and that's all yeah. messaging, right? That's all communication. That's everything that you, that we're talking about here, because until you get the offer right, all right, so you've thought about just what I talked about. Yeah, I use subs. Okay, great. Does that change the way that we write our, our sales scripts? Does that change the way that we, you know, what ads we approve? Does that change the, you know, the image that we're trying to create for our, for our, our clients? Absolutely. Does that maybe even change the client that we're going to do business with? For sure. All right. If I'm using a lot of subs and I can do higher volume, I might be looking at bigger homes. I might be looking at a place where that's not such a big deal, right? I might be looking at commercial. I might be looking at if that's the the source that I'm using, or again, I'm going to know to invest more in my management side. I have to have somebody in between the sub and the, and the owner, like you're a mediator, right? That's your job is to make everything move smoothly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you would be more present on that end. And again, that's going to give them, you know, that for most people, that's, that's going to be satisfying enough. Just don't lie about it. Right. Don't tell them you have all, you know, all in-house staff and then, you know, a bunch of slobs yeah. show up or again, you, you work with subs that only wear your uniforms, right? That's another option. We do it with ours. I mean, we demand like they have to, our, they have to put our magnets on their trucks. If they're there, they have to wear our uniforms. Like, you know, go look at my social media. You'll see everyone's wearing them, right? Everyone has those t-shirts on. Like, you know, again, that's the image that we're giving. And if they want the, the work that we offer, that's what they have to do. So, but again, like I said, these, when you're, when you're crafting this offer, you want to think of those specific things, right? It's all coming back down to like, wh what do people think about you? All right. Before or before the sale, during the sale and after and down the road. Okay. If you can, if you can make something that's, um, that that's got all of these things included in it, you're going to, you're going to be far further ahead of the competition, right? You're going to get more referrals. You're going to, your business will grow, you know, organically without you, right? Miss one of these things. And it, you know, again, if you're putting that out there and for years and years, everyone's like, yeah, he, Nick was awesome. We did a really great job, but you know, like I was looking for those uniformed guys. So, mm, you know, I don't really trust them. I've broken that trust right off the bat. You're like, they're not going to refer you. That like, it's just little things like that that can make all the difference. Yeah, yeah. Because I was just thinking about that. You know, trying to do a video and just getting shirts with the logo mm -hmm. and everything. And if they just show up with like a Budweiser shirt that looks like, yeah. So then you, so then you take it upon yourself if you want to put out that image, right? And you want to promote that. And by the way, like that is very attractive to a higher end clientele. That's what they want, right? like think about their fears and things that are, are effect, like affecting their decision-making. All right. The, the, what, the reason they would go with somebody like that is it shows establishment, right? It, it tells you, it, it shows that you have control and that, you know, you have culture in your business. Like those things are attractive. They, all that leads to peace of mind. They just want to get their job done, right? They want to get their problem solved. Okay. So if, if you know that that resonates with your, your audience, cool. 
right? Provided you actually know that that's what resonates, right? Because if, again, I'll tell you a good majority of our customers in the commercial side, they don't give a shit. It wouldn't, it has no bearing. I don't need to have lettered trucks. Like our commercial division, like none of that is relevant. It doesn't mean anything. In fact, it's like nobody, like how many companies do you see that have it even? Right. So I'm not going to invest in that. That's not going to be a part of my offer in that, in that sector. Um, he had reached out. I'm an electrician. He was looking for an electrician to do possible oh, service sorry. upgrades. Okay. So, um, again, in terms of validating some of these things, that's the, I find that that's kind of the, the hardest part is like, you have a business that's maybe growing. All right. You think your offer is good, but like, you're not really sure. Right. Or you want to offer a new service or you want to, you know, expand your business or you want to all of this stuff. And, and I'm going to tell you, like, this is a secret sauce that I've I've used to keep my business ahead um, is I regularly, regularly SWOT analysis. Like, again, especially with a new offer, you have to know what your competitors are doing. You have to look around you. All right. And really figure out what are the strengths and weaknesses of what I'm offering compared to what others are offering. All right. And again, for guys that are just starting out, I like, I can't stress it enough. If you want to save yourself a decade of pain, all right, learn to do this. Okay. Every owner that I've, um, that I've had this conversation with at one point or another, again, has said something that was an assumption to me. Okay. A lot of times I hear the statement, I already know I'm the highest price. Okay. Prove it. Where's your data? Show me your SWOT analysis. Prove it. Tell me that you are. And very rarely can, any, well, never, in fact, n not ever, has anyone been able to validate that they're the highest priced. I can validate and show you my whole SWOT analysis. I've got, you know, 15 different companies we've tested SWOT analysis this year, all right, to prove that there's yet been a quote that's, you know, that we're not the highest. Okay. So that's a validated fact. All right. So, um, we'll jump into this, by the way, this workbook has all of the tools that I'm discussing here. And like, we could get into SWOT analysis. It's its own like uh, school session. Um, what I'm going to recommend for you guys, if you're like, if you're uh, like trying to establish your offer, trying to validate an offer, trying to think of a new product to launch new service. All right. You guys got to start here. All right. I promise. So go through these tools. Um, they're pretty self-explanatory and we'll have another class just on uh, SWOT analysis itself. Cause it's, it's very powerful. All right. Especially for, again, peace of mind when launching new offers, um, you really can't, you can't do it without research. It's a gamble. It's a, it's like, um, going to the casino and putting all your money on red. Right. I mean, it might work, but most of the time it won't. Does that make sense? Are we, um, <clears throat> what's this thing doing? Is this, uh, are we trying to craft this offer by next week? Yeah. So tomorrow? I gave you guys some examples last week of like, you know, validated offers, offers that were like in the marketplace. We went through those, but yes, the whole purpose of this is before we start a sprint, before we do anything in our business, we've got to validate our offer now, um, to, to kind of add a little bit of prep, um, emphasis on this. Um, how many of you guys change your offers during the year or change your promotions? Anybody do that? Is anybody's core offer? Um, I do. Okay. I mean, I, I do seize for around the seasons. Perfect. Tell me about like that. that. But I, I do have one general message that runs every month too. Okay. So again, when we're, when like looking at the structures, so your core offer is rot repair, correct? Give me an example of something that you would offer over and beyond that offer that that ties into it. Sure. Uh, well, going into fall, we we have a lot of remote owners. Number one, uh, okay. we deal with permanent and remote. Uh, I put out an offer for fall uh, for um, inspecting your house before you're going into winter. OK, that's a perfect uh, example. And, so that's a mechanism. That's a lead into point, And it's based on a pain right, point. And, Okay. Yeah, and while we're out there, we'll do uh, an exterior analysis of the okay. property as well. Okay, I love that. That's a that's a great example, right? So that's about yeah. like customers have different needs at different times of the year, right? So seasonal mm -hmm. things like I'm a, I'm a roofer, so I know all too well, right? I'm not I'm not trying to offer you know 
brand new roof systems at Christmas, right? <laughs> Not a lot of people are we... in the mood to buying those, but you know One... what they are? Christmas lights, right? I have a right. pretty, I have a pretty decent Christmas light business that's organically grown, um, you know, over the years. Snow removal, things like that. Like again, those we... are other examples that still fit in our core offer, but they're seasonal that we can make, right? Yeah. And one, one thing I've made a lot of money on when I know there's going to be a deep freeze or something like mm -hmm. that, I send out a blast for uh, pictures of frozen pipes and what happens. Love that. And, another um, great example. That, huh? That's another not, not, fantastic example. Oh, okay. And a lot of my remote owners say, Hey, yeah, go. And I say, Hey, while we're there, we'll do a look around. So that's mm -hmm. my in for a lot. And when I do charge for that as well. Yeah. I, and again, that complements what you already do. Right. So um, I think that that's a good, a, a good example. That's not, not mine. Um, that is like the way we can market and bring in additional business to what we're doing, but it's still a part of the original offer, is it not? Right. And again, yes, would it you, is. you could make that offer, um, as a cold offer to the market, which I like, right. Cause everyone in general, if they don't even know you and they're cold, you could warm them up to that offer as well. So it could be an entry point for more work. You'd probably find rot and all those kind of things, you know, but you're creating a customer and giving them a lower barrier of entry to come in. So that's, that's perfect, right? That's totally what I'm trying to, I'm trying to get guys to recognize here. And one thing I'm launching right now mm -hmm. is uh, I've got to put the final details on it. And I'm going to have you help me roll it out sure. uh, is a, is a for recurring monthly revenue. I mm -hmm. uh, have a four tiered program of, uh, silver, I don't know, maybe I told you guys this, bronze, silver, gold, and then a platinum, yep. which is a la carte of um, recurring maintenance I love for that. people. And I mean, I have a huge, huge need for that. I've already tested the mark, tested my clients. Yeah. You guys will all warm my heart here if you have reoccurring revenue <laughs> contracts, because we all, we've talked about it a lot. Like that's how you build like real sellable value in your business. That's, that's brilliant. So again, a great example of an offer, right? And as we validate these things, as we have these ideas, all right, because we all have ideas. Um, if you don't, I've given you resources to the steal ideas, all right? But how do we actually validate them and not spend a bunch of money and time, you know, running them to clients that it doesn't, it doesn't resonate with, okay? This is the framework you want to follow, okay? So the other place we're going to collect is directly from customers we've already done business with. Okay. Um, so anybody that's using our software, you know, we're sending out um, surveys pretty consistently, um, you know, lost sales surveys, all of that, that data is so rich and so generally easy to, to accumulate. Um, and again, if you're not looking at how your customer changes over time and fluctuates, I, I can't like what works today. I promise you in this society and this, in the place that we are, it, it won't work in a year. It won't work in a year. And like, again, look at the way technology is changing. Look at the way the expectations have changed of the customer. You know, again, could you just be offering the same old, you know, I do electrical service. Yeah, you could you, technically. All right. But what's changed in the process of like landing customers, you've got, you know, guys using AI now that, you know, the, the speed, the lead and all that, that offer now, would get demolished, right? You there's just too much noise for you to succeed. Okay. So think about this this way. Like, how do you know when a market's changing? How do you know and actually see a trend start to develop in your business? Has anyone here seen a a trend in their business and was able to cap capture it and be, you know, ahead of the game with an offer? I, I do. I so that's my dog drinking in the background. No problem. I uh yeah, I I track everything. I okay. track um I track patterns yep. and things like that, and and uh, and base it off of that. Yep, absolutely. So again, you know, this is a simple exercise to like. Even if you have a good validated offer, it's going well. Okay, um, it's easy to get complacent. It's easy to get like you know b busy and off focus. If you were to do your SWOT analysis and mind your surveys, okay, again, easy stuff to collect you would find very quickly where trends start to appear, okay? So I'll give you a very good example of this that I have. Um, this year, we've seen a big, big drop in um, our standing C metal uh, product, all right? And the reason was obviously price. Even wealthy people were a little turned off with the price. 
Um, but what we introduced was um, a, um, a steel tile that was actually an exposed fastener, right? It's a very entry level product. Um, and for us, we seen the trends start last year where the demand and the searches started to climb for this product, this particular product that I'm referring to. Um, and we, we picked it up and honest to God, like it's, it's, it, it helped us with 40% of our, our revenue this year. All right. We didn't offer it last year. We didn't even have it on our thing. We were offering just a exposed fastener barn style roof and realizing that, Hey, in a residential setting, um, nobody wanted that. We knew that all already. That was like our good product, right? We do good, better, best. All right. But again, watching certain trends and certain feedback that we were getting, all right, we were able to say, okay, well, there's a growing demand for this, you know, economical steel shingle product. It's still exposed fastener. It's still quick insulation, right? And we jumped on that. And again, 40% in revenue, can't complain. We shifted, you know, from people going to our um, better package, right? Which was 80% last year, all right? To roughly about 50% this year, right? And then, you know, we picked up the rest and we've had nobody, not one client take our best offer where 10% of our business last year was best. So again, how do you adjust to that, right? If you're not paying attention to these things, you're not being able to um, re, um, reposition your offer or readjust it, you're going to get left behind, right? My business would have been very much in pain without that 40% in, in revenue, okay? Can I throw and, something else out there? Certainly. Something that's huge. It's uh, It was huge for me. Um <clears throat> Based on um, you know tracking and when when my big leads are coming in, what time of the year, mm -hmm. um, I noticed that actually just after the first of the year, like January second and third, I was getting a ton of phone calls. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I knew that people used to pe people would come out here for the holidays and spend time in their house and have the time to look around. So I would do my my uh, big advertising for this target spring market in in November and December mm -hmm. when I know they're. I love that. It's going to be on their minds. I do the same in um, like longer weekend Labor Day or in spring, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, two things here, guys, um, that I'm going to add. So we do have a, a tool for your product matrix. This is like the explanation of it, um, but your product mix. Okay. I think we've talked about this a few times, um, but for anybody that isn't um, like, hasn't heard that conversation, um, product mix inside your offer so like what i'm sharing with you what, what patty's sharing with you in terms of like um the type of product that you're offering maybe it's um you know a certain um well, panel replacement okay maybe it's you know a, a type of service that you offer they can have seasonality to it all right but you want to build your product mix and understand the sales trend to it okay so we have two tools that i'm going to share with everybody um, that's on the call today. One's going to be your product mix um, tool where it, it figures out like, again, I offer three different types of metal roofing systems. All right. But I very much call my shots on it. I know how much revenue I want to do in that same with my other services. So my reoccurring revenue services, all of those things are broken down and you can, if you want to visualize it, think about income on an income statement. All right. How much revenue is coming in from rot repair, from, you know, um, siding, from, you know, the revenue streams you have, okay? And what you want to be able to do is plan for those, okay? So another good example, if you, a lot of times in companies that I, that I work with, they have no idea about these revenue streams. Maybe they're doing commercial and residential and I can't tell you how many times, like twice this week, in fact, where I'm like, oh, okay, well, let's let's figure out, like, we'll take a snapshot of this in your product mix. And I'm trying to figure out how this company is offering their services. And lo and behold, you know, the, the, the owner is telling me, yeah, I make all my money in the residential service. Okay. We start to separate that income. And that's a lie. He's actually losing money on his residential service. And he's only making money in commercial. But in his opinion, that's what he wants to focus on is the residential. Why? Right? Doesn't make any sense. So if we're not doing product mix and tying that to profitability and to, you know, what what's important to move the business forward and looking at what one is the easy, more easily or scaled, we can very, very quickly, you know, put put things in front of us, roadblocks, 
all right, from getting to where we want to be. So I'll share the product matrix tool with everyone. And as well as on here, there's an explanation. Um, I think this actually might be my product matrix tool here. Yeah, there Where's it is. Where's that SWOT analysis? Where can uh, I locate that? It's on the, so in the, in the workbook, all of these tools are attached oh. as a link. You just click it. Yeah. Everything okay. we're talking about is in the workbook. Okay. So again, this is like exactly what I'm talking about, the product matrix tool, right? So again, you're going to take your service or product that you're offering, all right, and put it through the analysis, right? We want to do 1.8 million a year, okay? But how much of that is what service and what profit margins, okay? Very, very important that you understand your product mix, okay? Otherwise, what can happen, all right, and I see it all too much, especially when it comes to cash flow, all right. We, we get this thing in our head where we're doing really, really well on service. We've got all this cash We're we're feeling good. Then we go try and jump into commercial with no planning, no nothing. Don't realize, Hey, you know, yeah, commercial has more volume, less profit, and your money's being held hostage for a longer time. What's that do to the company? There goes the cash flow. All right. But here we are doubling down on something that we we can't take on. And it's just numbers. It, if we had looked and analyzed it first, we would have known that numbers don't lie. Right. Can we afford to do that? Right. Can we afford what our overhead, our direct cost of that product is? Is it even worth offering the product? Again, if there's no volume, no demand, and it's going to cost you, a, you know, an arm and a leg to market it, that's a dead horse. Get it off your like, don't offer that service. All right. And again, I see guys do this all the time. They keep, they keep, you know, thinking this thing's going to grow and it's not their, it's not their specialty and they lose money on it every year when they need to learn to just say no, right? The numbers won't lie to you. All right. So that's product matrix. Um, distribution channels again I, I don't think we'll maybe save this one for the next um for the next call um what i really want to um share with you guys is really an important tool for anybody that's thinking about their offer all right what i want everyone to do um is to do a sales analysis and i have a tool for it if you want to get some super high value um something that's going to return you large amounts of piles of cash do my sales analysis tool all right um, what it's going to do is it's going to look at the last five years of your business. And we're going to very simply take what the information out of your QuickBooks, right? And it, all it looks at is your revenue month by month by month. Okay. And when we put that all in into a, an analysis, we're going to figure out what our sales trend is. What months are we selling the most? What months are we selling the least? Okay. And that helps us to really craft our offer. Okay. Again, everybody has some sort of seasonality to their business. And I'll tell you that the majority of contractors that I've worked with, um, they run into the same brick wall every single year and they just assume that that's the way it is, okay? What's the point in doing all this work, getting an offer together, thinking about your marketing, doing all that, and then never really analyzing when's the right time to offer this, okay? So the time to be marketing for something is not when you're out of work. Is not when you need, that's the worst time to, to think about marketing. It's the worst time to try and, and add something because a lot of us just think it's a, you know, um, we'll throw money at the problem and that's not, that's not the case, okay? If we were to look at our sales trends um, and again, anyone that's going to be joining the, the, the um, 100K and 30 day challenge, this is a requirement. You need to, you need to know what months that we're trying to build volume and revenue into. OK, don't be trying to launch a new offer in a time when you, you know, again, statistically are the busiest. Don't do that. That's stupid. OK, that's only going to that's only going to create a crash in your business. All right. When we launch offers, timing of that offer is just as important as all the other elements that I've talked to you about today. OK, so what I recommend for anybody is think about those off pieces of your revenue. Like it's much easier to scale. All right. Scale means to get the things you got already working optimally. All right. Before we're going to do any scaling, which is growing. Okay. So if you have trends where business is dropping off or you're having big months followed by smaller months, we need to, we need to stabilize the revenue. And you could do that by running a promotion or a new offer. That's going to bring in that additional income for that month. All right. Now, 
here's the, the kick in the chops about marketing. All right. It takes about 90 days. So anything I'm doing today, all right, has a direct effect to what's going to happen in 90 days. And that's, that's, that's the same across the board. Now, can you generate leads and all that? Yes, you can. But to properly do this, the, the, the way you want to think about it is I'm planning ahead, right? Getting all this stuff done is tough, right? I say 30 days and a hundred K in 30 days. Yeah. That's just the sales dude. That's just the sales part of it. Getting this stuff working. That's going to take, this is the real, like, real work. But once you get it up and we, we get it balanced to your business, this is how you can consistently grow. All right. And the best part is we can actually predict and call our shots. All right. We can say, Hey, my goal is to increase this product mix, you know, by 20%. All right. And then we can validate all of that. How good would that feel? Right. Who here really wants to be able to call their shot? Would that be valuable to anybody? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Who here, like, again, wants to get off the revenue roller coaster? I do. The feast and famine. Me. Any, anybody really enjoy that? Like, is anybody, because it's possible. I'm not, I'm not, and I'm not being smart or anything. Um, I have met many owners that are addicted to that, right? They're addicted to the highs and lows, right? But mm -hmm. is that a way to run your business? Is that what you want for your business? I hate the lows. All right. So I'll tell you from my own experience. Um, again, there's always going to be ups and downs in business, no matter what, like, you know, but where you want to really kind of recognize um, is growth comes from consistency, Right you know, it happens, it, it can happen very quickly, but it's maintaining that, right? I often say, and for some of you probably already heard me, it sound like a broken record, but I want to run the most boringest business in the world. I'm on a mission to have the most boringest, like easiest business to run in the world, all right? I don't want anything exciting. I don't want anything new. I don't want, like I'm, I'm past that stage, all right? I want the same thing every single day done the same exact way over and over and over again with very slight adjustments. All right. That's all I want. Okay. You Is there anybody else? Confusing. What's that? Um, a little, it's, it's kind of, it's very overwhelming to me, actually. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's so simple, but once you get everything rolling, right. I know it rolls, but to remember to do, Oh, I got to do the SWOT analysis. How often do I do that? When do I do that? When do Calendar. I plug this in here? And when do I do that? Mm -hmm. Well, again, it's, it's really about for, for me, while I'm bringing this all up is like, all of us want to grow, right? No, nobody's here not to grow. I asked you all that question before we worked together. There wasn't a single person that told me, nope, I'm looking to actually decline. Okay. So in order to have proper growth, to have stable growth, to have, you know, manageable and, uh, you know, profitable growth, these are the things that it requires. Now, do you have to do it, you know, maybe twice a year? All right, we're gonna do it. Can it be delegated? I'm giving you how to delegate it. Here's the tool, hand it off, right? Have your, your VA, like have other people doing it, but make it a part of your culture that we're checking for these things. I do it in my business. Again, do you think that I'm on the phone calling people up to come and give me a quote on my roof? You think that's me? No, I don't have time for that, all right? Am I, am I out in the field getting other people's quotes and bringing them in and our team? Like, I'm not doing any of that. All right. My job is to facilitate it though. It goes on the calendar. All right. I make it clear that it's being done. I make sure that it, it got done. And, and again, you know, these kind of high level things, I am making the calls on the offers, right? I am the final say on whether we run a, a certain product mix or not. Right. So again, manageable, Mm, yeah, this would be tough all on your own. What I'm trying to teach you guys to do is like, there's, there's easy ways and hard ways to do everything. Right. And what seems easy, like, Hey, I'm just going to test this offer. Right. And I've, how many of you maybe done that and gotten lucky? I know I have, I've put offers out there that like my Christmas light one, I shared that story with you. I just threw it out there and it grew. Don't know why got lucky with it. Right. But that's rare. That doesn't happen. And again, there was lots of problems with that offer in delivering it, right? Most people try it and it fails and then they give up and they get scared of making adjustments or changes to the offer. 
And again, that's not how you're going to get growth, right? We should always be trying to improve the thing that brings in all of the money, all right? It's not your marketing. Again, I'm going to tell you that with the, the, the strongest of conviction. It's not your marketing. Anything that is irresistible or like is a no-brainer in a market is going to grow no matter what, right? If you can make your offer the same, and you think about all the mechanisms, all the stuff that goes into your business, it's all a off. That is what you like. That's, that's what's going to get you millions of dollars or not. Right. Okay. Make sense. You got one minute. You got 30 seconds here. I know yeah. you got another me meeting here. It shows. Sure. Um, can you open the chat and just read my little, I don't know. That's on my road to some kind of offer. Electrically Elite provides lightning fast, responsive, and reliable service you can count on. Need service now? No worries. I love that. So again, 24-7, 365, call us. Yeah. So again, you're going to appeal on your service thing. Um, anybody that's seeing that, that has an emergency right now is going to pick up the phone and call you, right? If that's the outcome and that's what I'm reading into here, perfect. So that would be for, yeah, responsive emergency right. service. Now- are those the ideal clients? I mean, you can charge them more, but generally it's a person that's let their property fall, mm -hmm. doesn't maintain, and is a scabby client. Not well, that's an time. assumption though. So okay, it is. I need you yeah. to I need you to show me your data. I don't have any. Well, there you go. So you just made an assumption. So this is what I mean about missing the blue ocean by, you know, again, making assumptions. And we all can make assumptions. Like the thing about marketing in your offer is that like without the validation part. You guys are basically going to the casino and betting on red and it's, it, and it, it's harder and harder to get offers that resonate with your, with your customer. Okay. You may figure out like, Hey, you know what? We run this offer to validate it. Yeah. The customer base is the searches are there. Everything's there. Okay. Um, but yeah, you know what? It does lead to scuzzier customers. Okay. How do I make money from this? Up goes my service call fee, right? I'm going to make money off just going out there to the scuzzy house that they need the emergency service. My hourly rate's going to be ridiculous and I'm going to offer financing. Boom, you're done. Right? Like you see what I'm saying? So we need to make adjustments, but like each step as you break it down and you don't like, this isn't something you have to do every single day of your life. Like this is something we do a couple times a year to make sure that we are optimizing our biggest asset, which is the business. The business is the, business is the offer. That's the thing, right? You, like any piece of that comes apart. You also want to be able to diagnose where the problem is. If you start getting bad reviews out of nowhere, how easy is it to say, oh, well, it's the technician's fault. Guy must be doing a shit job. Okay. Was he trained? Right. Adequately? Was he trained? Like, again, you should be going through a checklist, right? Now we're going to go back. Did something change in my messaging? Here we go. Right. Like it's, again, you're building that infrastructure for yourself and when you go through this process, you realize like, this just saved me decades, literally, right? Because how many guys, and when you start to pay attention, it's just like when you get a new car and all of a sudden you see your new car everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And you're like, fuck, I, this car was unique when I bought it. Now everyone has one, right? Same effect is going to happen when you, with what I'm bringing up. You're going to start looking at other people's offers and being like, wow, that's identical to the other fucking guy that I've seen three or four times, right? What's what's the problem with that right he's lost in the sea right well and it, it's not differentiated so again he's the guy that gets the call two out of ten times right to the the customer that's looking for low budget cheap services whereas yours might speak specifically to you know with some adjustment to that maybe we can make that speak to a higher end clientele right you know making yeah. sure that the upfront service fee is 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 showing like you, there's little things you can do to, that will completely change the audience. Three words can change your entire audience and the people that respond to your ad or to your, to your offer. Right. Yeah. A lot of our like good commercial service clients, mm -hmm. like they pay, they don't ask twice. It's just get it done. Right. Right. And that's where like this, I want this note to go towards is, you know, high paying value, the responsiveness, right. don't mind paying, come here, fix this now. Right. So again, there's a number of ways and we won't get like into all of it, but like validate it first. Like, is there enough volume of those customers, right? What would we need to hit to make this really make sense? 
All right. And then you work backwards, right? Like what kind of sales process do I need to offer? What kind of, um, you know, what's their expectations? Um, you know, the other thing would be the image that you share with them. Are you going to be sharing a residential like house? No, you're going to be vividly showing a commercial property. Um, taught, you know, again, maybe your social media tells the story of how you help the commercial like owner, right? You've got commercial property owners used as the example business names versus like, you know, individuals giving you reviews, like all of that shit is like very quickly our brains, like we look at things and just, I challenge you all, like start looking at the offers that are being made to you constantly, every day, all day, right? Everywhere you go, everywhere you look, there's an offer there. Okay. If you open up your phone, you use social media, like people are making offers to you nonstop. Okay. I also, really break them I also down. go on yeah. well, I also go on neighborhood quickly, uh, neighborhood Facebook groups and mm -hmm. ask what their needs are or town, and, you know, kind Love of that. do something like that just for everybody. It's been yeah. it's been huge. Yeah, no, and I mean that's one of my top like if like again for generating um business, but again, you're gonna know about that clientele in there, right? They're community based. Are you gonna get lots of referrals? Oh hell yeah, right. Are you going to get some of those scuzzier lower end people? Of course, right? But we got to be able to screen them out. So again, when we start to look at like our our inputs, right? And I feel like a lot of people get, you know, lose a lot of um, opportunity because the input has to match the offer as well, right? So if we're pulling leads from Google, I'll tell you right now, that's not the same person you're going to pull from Facebook. Totally different mindsets, Right in my experience yep 100 percent different one is researching the, because they're in a community platform and they were you know entertaining themselves and you interrupted that <laughs> right so like you're the, you're going to get a lot more but they're going to be of lower quality right however when you go to google higher intent but if your offer hasn't stood out to them and they're ready to buy now problem aware solution aware all right you and you don't stand out then you're just you're going to find yourself being used for price Right. Especially in that in that condition, you have three seconds to make an impression. If the three top ads that are running all look the same, sound the same, they're going to close their eyes, pick the guy that they want at that moment. But if you can stand out even a little bit, all right, that's going to create a whole different like and I'm telling you, like the difference between making no money and making millions is exactly what I'm referring to here. Right. Know your person, know your avatar, like test your offer. And again, make those small adjustments and always be able to like maintain it, right? Test it, validate it. And again, you'll see like that's, there's nothing, that's a hundred thousand dollar an hour job. I'm going to tell you right now. That's like, you couldn't spend your time doing anything more valuable to your business, to everything, to your own like mental health, right? Because who likes to sit at, in, in bed at night and go, fuck. I hope I have work next week, next month, next year, right? I hope I like I hope that I'm going to grow. I hope that I'm going to have enough to pay my bills. I hope you don't have to hope. We can plan, right? You can like it's just numbers and data. Okay. Completely off topic and I stole most of this meeting, but mm -hmm. um if you had limited time resources like me mm -hmm. and you wanted to do outreach to like in-person outreach, would mm -hmm. you do cha like a chamber BNI type thing or a direct contractor walk in the front door honestly like how i do mine um so cold email cheapest fastest way to do it right so reaching out to them to warm them up um mm -hmm. caller so sdr like cold calls to, to get in the door my my go-to my most successful one is after you've done those two things mm -hmm. um actual um expedited mail with mm -hmm. like a gift in it all right. So once you've made contacts and you like I use the foot, I, I I think I've shared it with you guys a few times. I'll share you. I'll post it, too. I use a foot like it's a sucker. It's a maple sucker. And I okay. send it out with the, like I was just trying to get my foot in the door, but I actually put it in like registered mail and I send it send them out. It's like four or five bucks a piece. But I know it's going directly to the owner of that company that I'm trying to I'm trying to contact. Right. It gets past everybody else, all the gatekeepers. And I mean, it just fucking works, right? So my ROI is like obscene. But if they don't have any information about you prior to that, because what will happen is what? They're going to Google search you. They'll see you pop up in their email. Like you have to do those other things to warm them up. And again, validate that those are, because that can get really, really expensive. 
if you're trying to just send them to a bunch of randos. That's how I would do it. That's the fastest, like quickest way not, to do it. Not just walking in, shaking hands or meeting at a meeting at a chamber thing. Lo chambers like chambers not bad but you're again it, it it's all depends on your intent right like i'm i'm trying to do f like three to four million dollars worth of business like every single year with you know a certain brand of customers i don't have time for chamber meetings i don't and i don't have the energy for it either and what i find most time is you're getting solicited my experience anyways you're getting solicited more is it good yeah it can help but like i'd rather just spend my money on getting through the door and like directly into the hands of the person i'm trying to do business with Money and me time. Right. I, I just figured out what you, I'm like, what the hell? A foot with a maple leaf. What the hell? Oh, Toronto maple leaves. Yeah. I forgot you guys are my friends to the north. Right. Okay. Well, the maple syrup it. thing. Yeah. It's the, uh, cause we're Canadians. Right. So it's a, uh, I think so. Yeah. That's worked great for me. Like it's just a, uh, you know, so get, get on, people get call me laughing studies. about it. It's, it's get, get on my, my case studies. Door. Yeah. Case studies. That's the other thing we use, but all of that stuff, a lot of times what we're doing is like your audience is seeing it. All right. On average, it takes nine times seeing your brand. All right. Before anyone will ever recognize you as a brand. Okay. So nine touches have to be done. Now, again, if I'm going to spend 25 grand on a, on a mail, um, a mailer, which it will cost me every year. All right. If I'm going to spend 25 K for that, four mail that's that's a shot in the dark no big deal but i want to make sure that i'm supporting that and like again i'm re re-engaging the audience and i use all those other methods as well right now they may produce one or two or three percent but you know 50 percent of the leads come from that one campaign all right if i didn't do the things before it though it'd probably only be 25 percent. okay same thing like when you're running um ads campaigns for example if you're not running your social media organic your ads are going to fail uh, most of the time, right? Your ad cost is going to be very, very high if you're not present on social media. Because what do people do? They check you out, right? They look at your reviews. They go on your social media. They see if you're a legitimate company. Like all of those things matter, right? So for me, there's no one, like one method beats all. It's really a matter of, you know, combining those things, starting, you know, with something that can be repeatable easily. Like you going in and knocking doors and meeting with owners, that involves you, right? Hard yeah. to scale that, right? Fair. Like when you're, when you're, when you want to go golfing, who's knocking on doors? True. Right. So yeah, just, just your approach. We can talk a lot about that, but anyways, guys, I am way over time here. Um, hope everyone got some value from today and we'll, uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you, Jake. Yep. Thanks, Jake. Thanks guys. Bye.